Hello everybody, welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club. This is a highlights reel of a webinar we did yesterday on gyrocopter accidents. It was a two and a half hour event with interactive Q&A. If you'd like to obtain a copy of the entire webinar, details of how to do so are in the description. It was well received and I'm hosting another webinar on Saturday the 18th of July on gyrocopter takeoffs and I'll highlight how to get involved in the middle of this week. For the meantime, enjoy this highlights package. Right, let's move on. So, this is actually a Sierra C-17. Uh, it wasn't the very first Sierra aircraft, but it was one of the first. And you can see that it was based on uh, a fixed wing fuselage. In fact, this was something called an, Av an Avro Avian. And an Avro Avian would be a biplane, but what they've done is they've chopped the top wing off and replaced that with a rotor. And uh, the reason that they used aircraft fuselages is because for directional control in pitch and in roll, they still retained the aeroplane control. So you've got ailerons for roll, elevators for pitch. Campbell used to be the importer for Benson in the UK. And uh, you can see now we've got a, uh, a nice pod, fuel tank mounted centrally behind the pilot. Uh, this was actually a Volkswagen four-stroke, two, still a two-bladed prop. And these were relatively benign performing aircraft, actually. They weren't, they weren't uh, rocket ships and they didn't profess to be. This next one was starting to get to perform in, uh, higher performance. This is something called a Brooklyn's Mosquito. That guy in the picture is a guy called Ernie Brooks, which we'll uh, learn a little bit more about him soon. Uh, he actually was uh, an interesting chap in the sense that he was one of the very first gyroplane pilots in the UK. He was a gyroplane instructor. Uh, he probably got getting on for one of the highest number of hours logged in gyroplanes globally at the time. This is into the 60s. And he was also one of the very first guys that put a Volkswagen four-stroke onto a gyroplane. Uh, he was, by trade, he was a, a mechanic, uh, automotive mechanic, and uh, he had a passion for, 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 for aviation and certainly gyroplanes. And he'd been involved in doing his own thing with, basically, he started with a B7, or sister aircraft. Uh, he hadn't, he hadn't, he wasn't very recent. As you can see, the aircraft, uh, it's very aerodynamic. It, it's a Rolls-Royce Continental uh, aero engine, four-bladed prop. You can see all of the undercarriages fed in and so on. And obviously Wallace had a lot of engineering respect anyway. And uh, at the Farnborough Air Show, which is pro probably at the time in 1970, the, the biggest uh, aeronautical show in, in the world, and as a result of his death, again, another wing over, uh, low G, uh, the AIB uh, really went to town. Uh, they did a lot of simulating, a lot of modeling work. In the end, didn't really give any more insight than, the, than what the PRA had been writing in their magazines, you know, ten, uh, five or six years before. Uh, but the problem was, Whereas you could say, oh, well, you've got some eccentric guys crashing Benson's or crashing Brooklyn's mosquitoes that they built in their own shed, you couldn't say that with this. This was a proper aero, aero company with a proper test pilot at the world's biggest aviation show. And unfortunately, the, uh, the report that was produced from the AIB took four years to come out. So you've got this huge vacuum of literally, you know, for, to everybody else, knowing nothing for four years, and it completely changed uh, the, the fortunes of, of the sporting gyroplane. All of the newer aircraft that you guys are getting are the ones that we've been flying for, for a long time now. And one of the interesting things is, is that these aircraft, Magni and Autogyro product, they're not actually, they're not the greatest things in the sense that, They've got huge uh, power yaw couple. So power changes make huge yaw changes. And which is why we have all of these uh, landing 
uh, and take off accidents. And I think that's coming. Oh, and, and certainly it's, it's already evident in some of the accident data that's from the US. And so what I mean to say is, when you see some of these snags that people, what, what, what I highlight and I have highlighted on the channel, and people are, it's very easy to go, well, that's not going to be a problem, surely. How can that be a problem? You mark my words, that it's the little detail that trip you up. And we'll look at that uh, shortly. But because what happens is people don't want to criticize because, of course, when one guy or one faction is dominant, you criticize that and then you become the outlier and then you become the target and easy to be, you know, try to be trodden on. And, that, and I think that is a situation that we, that we have today. The other thing that is a problem is poor data and poor documentation. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, poor data. You know, there's been very few real aerodynamic uh, studies done into gyroplane uh, or gyrocopter flight by hard-hitting scientists. Um, you know, the Glasgow University, we, we did, but actually they made a mistake because there was some fundamental error, predictable bandwagon, oh, it's a blade flap. And the reason they did that is because the NTSB report talks about the fact that he used the word rotated at 55 knots. And, and any time anybody says, oh, rotated, they go, oh, that's a fixed wing term. It's not a, he's not flying like a gyro pilot. He's a filthy fixed wing pilot and he's trying to rotate. And that's what that's all they focus on. But actual fact, one of the things that's interesting for the NTSB, and I don't know whether you, you guys are all aware of this, but I find it interesting. I found this out recently. Because the US is very open, uh, at the bottom they've got this thing called an investigation docket. And what that is, is if you click on that, you get the actual documentation that the pilot himself submitted. Now, the NTSB report isn't actually that helpful because what it does is that they've basically tried to summarize what the pilot said. And because nobody in the NTSB flies a gyroplane, they've got no idea what's important or not important to the average guy. So, for example, at no point here, literally at no point here, do they talk about differences training. They don't say it. Nothing at all. There's literally no information about the fact that this guy had not flown with a 915 engine in his cab long before. However, let's have a look at what is in the docket. So back to my gormless face. Come back to the pilot report. It's quite good, this uh, Zoom, isn't it, really? Of the US invention. Probably the Brits invented it, but gifted it somehow for free to America. Oh, hang on, let's get this. Talking nonsense. There you go. So this is what the pilot, you know, he's got way too nose high. He's behind what I call the drag curve. A lot of guys call the power curve. And he's sunk back onto the runway and the things roll over. And, and that for me is, is starts and finishes at the fact that he just did not have uh, differences training. It's obviously a necessary uh, part of the takeoff process and part of the training. Because if you fly a single seater, uh, you are necessarily on your own the very first time you fly it because you're not, there's no two seat element. So the last thing that the instructor wants when he's instructing a pilot that's just about to go on his own in a single seater, he doesn't want the guy to end up being hundreds of feet in the air. He wants the guy to build up to these things slowly and in a manageable way and feeling his way forward because that's the only safe way to do it. Free rotate here with the thumb off and the sticks all the way forward. I'm building rotor RPM. And I release the wheel brake to start, but I don't bring the stick back. I leave the stick forward. And now I'm rocketing off on the ground roll. Why am I rocketing off? Because I've got no rotor drag, because the rotor's still flat. 
and I'm going forward at a rate of knots. And of course, at some point, I realize, oh, crikey, I've got the stick forward. What an idiot. I pull the stick back, and of course, what's happened? The rotor RPM has decayed. When this accident happened, a lot of people said, and, and if you remember to one of the earlier comments I made, they said, oh, you know, if it could happen to John Judge in a Ken Wallace aircraft, it could, it could happen to anyone. And, and when Chris Lord got killed in a Cavalon at Sebring, there were a lot of people that said, oh, if it can happen to Chris Lord, it can happen to me. Uh, now, I don't want to sound arrogant, uh, but I can tell you that this accident could never have happened to me. And I'd like to think that everybody in the room, it will never happen to you either. Because what Chris Lord's done here, I've honestly got no idea. I mean, I've genuinely got no idea. I know it's, you know, it's a bit, um, it's a bit, what's the word? It, it's not very, uh, it's not very gentlemanly to, to criticise someone given what's happened, but I've got to say, you, you, you just got to call it how you see it. 